Yesterday, uh, there was, uh, well, Father John uh, was supposed to do the five o'clock mass, but he got a flat tire. And so I hadn't prepared fully my homily. And so it was the shortest homily I've ever given so far as a priest. <laughs> and um, this morning I shared my homily and it keeps getting longer at every mass. So <laughs> I remember a little girl who, who, went to, who came to mass with her mother and the priest was going on and on and on and the little girl whispered in her mother's ear saying, mom, do you think if we give him the money now, he'll let us go? <laughs> so it's not so long, I promise you. So Jesus is a king and as we heard, his kingdom is not of this world, but it is in the world. In fact, Jesus inaugurates the kingdom of God in, among us in, in, in space and time. In the incarnation at Christmas, with baby Jesus, that is, that, that's where the kingdom of God breaks into time and space, which the prophet Daniel prophesied, but also which the book of Revelations reminds us we're still tending toward that fullness when Jesus will return in glory. And so in, in our theology, we talk about this and use a big word, which is eschatology. We have an eschatolo eschatological vision of the kingdom of God, of the already, the kingdom of God is already among us, but not yet fully. And so we tend toward that fullness when God will be all in all. If you look at our world, if you, are, um, if you let yourself be, uh, if you look at the world through the lens of the news and so on, you can get discouraged. But we have to believe that any future is better than any past, precisely because the kingdom of God broke into our midst through Jesus. And Jesus spoke about the kingdom of God so many times in scripture. I just want to point out to you all of the times that he, not all of them, but many of the times, and you'll, you'll be familiar with all of these scriptures because we hear them at mass and in the readings all the time. You might remember when Jesus says that the kingdom of God is like a merchant searching for fine pearls and sells everything to acquire those pearls. So it's something precious. Jesus reminds us, seek first the kingdom of God and all his righteousness and all these things will be given you besides. Aren't you worth more than the birds of the air, the flower, the, the, the grass of the fields? And yet not even Solomon in all his splendor was arrayed as one of these, God provides. Jesus also tells us that whoever obeys and teaches these commandments of his to others will be, got, will be called greatest in the kingdom of God. He tells us to be decisive. Who sets hand to the plow and looks back is not fit for the kingdom of God. He reminds us or he tells us that the, t the kingdom of God belongs to the poor in spirit Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. He tells us that it belongs to children. So to call it, the, uh, the calling is to be childlike, to depend on God for everything. He, he reminds us that the rich enter the, enter the kingdom of God with difficulty because of their attachments to, to, their, to their things. He... T he, he not only invites us, but he, he teaches us to pray for the coming of the kingdom constantly. Every time we say the Our Father, we say thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Jesus in Matthew warns leadership about being an obstacle to the kingdom of God. So parents, supervisors, managers, pastors, but woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, because you shut off the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God from people, for you do not enter in yourselves, nor do you allow those who are entering to go in. He also tells us that the first shall be last, 
and the last shall be first in the kingdom of God. In Matthew 21, 31, he says, truly I say to you that the tax collectors and prostitutes will get into the kingdom of God before you. He tells us that he is the door that, enter, that allows us to enter the kingdom of God. To the disciples, he gives the keys to the kingdom, which he declared loosed on earth will be loosed in heaven, which you forgive on earth will be forgiven in heaven. That's our theology of the sacrament of confession. Everywhere Jesus, Jesus went, people were confronted by the wonders and power of the kingdom of God, and they were trying desperately to get into it. He reminds us that the kingdom of God grows with weeds. You know that the church, our church is a, a, a church of, of saints and sinners. I've met many saints. I represent the sinners. But I remember a, a lady who told a priest once, she said, Father, I don't go to church anymore. I don't go to mass because it's full of hypocrites. And the priest responded, yes, and there's always room for one more. <laughs> and so he reminds us that the kingdom of God grows with weeds and the angels will sift through it at the end of times. He reminds us it starts small like a mustard seed and grows into an enormous tree. It's like yeast that leavens everything. In Matthew, again, he reminds us who are the ones who enter the kingdom of God. He says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the ones who do the will of my Father. And finally, Luke reminds us, the kingdom of God is in our midst. The kingdom of God is right here, right now. When I was 15 years old, I had an experience of the kingdom of God. It was at a retreat. And the people there were from different ages, from babies to the elderly, different backgrounds, different cities, even different countries. There were men, there were women, there were mostly lay people, but there were priests and nuns as well. And each day, the emphasis was on putting the gospel into practice in small, concrete ways, in that handshake, in that smile. But also people were helping each other with their children. People listened to each other, and I could see this. They would listen to each other profoundly. They were engaged with each other with true esteem and delight at meeting a new person. People, people eagerly were letting the elderly through the lunch line or the dinner line. In other words, people were consciously, intentionally, and creatively putting gospel words into, into practice moment by moment. And these small acts of love that just kept multiplying among the 300 or so people present at this retreat this had such an impact, such a profound impact on me that at, that at the end of this five-day retreat, the, the union with God that I experienced was beyond words. It was like I was floating in air. And at the same time, I felt so connected to each one of the 300 people who were there. Before this experience, my union with God was, was that, my union with God, my personal union with God. Now, because of this experience of the kingdom of God among us, I understood that unity with our brother, our sister, our neighbor was necessary for a fuller union with God. I felt that I understood what it means to experience the kingdom of God among us. And it has to be so because Jesus brought to earth the life of heaven. And what is the life of heaven, the life of the Trinity? It's mutual love. And so when it's put into practice, we experience the kingdom of God. So when the retreat was over, I told a friend or a person I met there, I said, I said, this is so beautiful, but now we have to go back to the real world. And this was his response to me. He said, maybe this, this is the real world. And the world you're going to is the fake one. Just like the apostles at Mount Tabor, they wanted to build tents and stay there forever. And so we're called 
to, to build the kingdom of God there where we are. And so here's an experience, a lived experience of someone who sought to live the kingdom of God in his work environment. And this is what happened. He's a doctor and he works at a hospital. And he shared this experience. He said, I had to do the night shift with another doctor. This other doctor was, was Catholic, but was not a practicing Catholic. And seeing that I attended mass almost every day, he very often made fun of me. Our shift lasted all night, but he would leave at the end of the evening, and this meant much more work for me. Despite this, I tried to keep an open attitude towards him without judgment for a month, two months, three months. One day, he expressed his desire to join me for Mass. He told me, during these months, I have learned many things from the way you love in silence. Since then, he does not only see to his duties fully, but he also sees that I don't overtire myself during the night. Theologian Frederick Beekner put it this way when he was speaking about seeking and building and yearning for the kingdom of God, and he said it so beautifully, and I'll end with this quote. He said, if we only had eyes to see and ears to hear and wits to understand, we would know that the kingdom of God, in the sense of holiness, goodness, beauty, is as close as breathing. And it is crying out to be born within ourselves, among us, and within the world. We would know that the kingdom of God is what we, all of us, hunger for above all other things, even when we don't know its name or realize it's what we're starving to death for. The kingdom of God is where our best dreams come from and our truest prayers. We glimpse it at those moments when we find ourselves better than we are and wiser than we know. We catch sight of it when at some moment of crisis, a strength seems to come to us that is greater than our strength. The kingdom of God is where we belong. It is home. And whether we realize it or not, I think we are all of us homesick for it. <laughs>